Mohammed, first of all, I want to wish a very happy birthday to Sasha. Um, it's a wonderful thing to come together here. This is not just an interesting conference, it's a convivial conference which is perfectly organized. So I feel very privileged and honored to be here. And thank you to Gore Ventura. And happy birthday to you too. And a continued career doing all of the wonderful things you've been doing for 40 years. Um, well, as you've already had a demonstration that uh, we've been asked to think the contemporary. And the contemporary is very different for everyone here. And certainly for every one of you. It depends on your education, your social class, your religion, your work, uh, your age, your language, etc., uh, etc. Et so um, there is no hope that any one of us can, can cover all of the contemporary. I'm going to be very practical and very empirical. We've had some demonstrations of the differences between us, which are healthy. But uh, there are also some generalities that I would like to make, which uh, we can't escape our own contemporary. And I want to remind you that we are very privileged, all of us here, to have a contemporary which is much broader than most people in the world can afford. Half the world, that's more than three and a half billion people, <laughs> are living on less than $2.50 a day. Among them, 1.3 billion people are living on less than half that, $1.25 a day. And 800 million of them are hungry, literally, chronically hungry every day. Their contemporary has to be limited to survival. How am I going to get food today? I'm not going to be there. They are not thinking about other boundaries than that. They can't afford to. Um, yesterday and today, 360,000 women have been, <coughs> and their contemporary, I hope, is joy to have a child. But not always. It's not always the case. And 150,000 people die today. And 22,000 families have to watch one of their children die. And their contemporary is sorrow. And on the other hand, although half the world has very little power, there are 2,043 people, exactly, listed by Forbes as billionaires. And these 2,043 people together have a collective fortune of $7.7 .7 trillion. Now, nobody can deal with a trillion. A trillion means 12 zeros after one, right? So I try to explain this by saying, look at your watch. Have you got a second hand on your watch? The gentlemen probably do, the ladies may do not. But if you have a second hand on your watch, and if every second is one dollar, you have to wait 32,000 years watching your watch, <laughs> and then you will arrive at one trillion seconds or dollars. So if you have a collective fortune of $7.7 .7 trillion, that means not only that you have about one-tenth, 10% of the world GDP, but you have 250,000 years of looking at your watch to arrive at that figure. And that belongs, and I take Professor Rogobe's point, about wealth being a totally relative thing, but here it's a very contemporary and very powerful thing to have one-tenth of world GDP and only 2,043 people who are sharing that. So um, I think if we are privileged 
particularly because we have enough to eat, because we are uh, students or, or teachers or intellectuals in some way or another, that means that we are able to take on the multiplicity of the world and at least arrive at a partial view of what the contemporary is. And I think this means that we have to look geographically at the whole world, but not just geographically, obviously. Uh, we also have to look at our, uh, at our climate, which is going to rule more and more. I will come back to this because this is going to be our future. What the climate is going to tell us will be a part of our future that we can't do anything about unless, unless there is still time. And that nobody knows whether there is still time or not. But that means also that we have to try to understand different peoples, different cultures. We've had already a sample from Africa, from India. And for instance, Rajiv and I have a very different view of the Enlightenment. For me, the Enlightenment, the 18th century, was a remarkable event. It's not just one event, it's a whole process. But it brought us democracy and the rule of law. It brought us a lot of terrible things, too. But the French Revolution and the American Revolution, to me, uh, were ne not only necessary, but beautiful occasions to change the world and to change the contemporary. And what worries me, perhaps, along with the climate, the most, is that we seem to be backtracking on that environment of the, of the um, enlightenment. We seem to be saying goodbye to it. Populism, uh, the desire for uh, an authoritarian government instead of a democratic government. This, in my view, is not healthy, but we see it happening everywhere. We see it in Brazil in a very big and surprising way places you thought were democratic and that the whole discussion was over with and would remain democratic, well, no. You can always go backwards in that sense. So, anyway, we, we have to try to sort out the political differences, the, the economic differences, the environmental differences, etc. And we have to always remember, I think, that there's an impossibility for a very large part of humanity not to be able to take on any part of this. So let's always remember how privileged we are because we have that space. And this space should never be neglected. I know as students you are thinking about it, but the older you get, the more you will understand that you are in a very privileged position. So we're the lucky ones. But the conference is also, it's not just a session about the contemporary and thinking about it, but it's also about the future. And we have to have an eye on the future, but I think this may be the first time in human history, which means that, um, which entails that thinking about the future means thinking what is irreversible. Up to now, at least for two or three hundred years, we've been able to think, well, if the political and social aspects of our world need to change, we can fight for those changes. But now, have we time? Is the climate going to give us time? Or is, it going to, or is the uh, political atmosphere going to give us time? Will we be able to reverse certain tendencies? This is totally problematic, um, and I'm also uh, interested that we are not, and here again we're very different, um, we're not thinking in religious terms or about God or the gods or about um, immovable and, and uh, uh, indestructible forces which are influencing our contemporary day, uh, we have to think about the ruthless destruction of biodiversity 
and of the planet that we live on. Can we reverse this destruction of, of biodiversity? It's not sure. Otherwise stated, can we change the rules? Can we change the laws of physics, chemistry, biology? I'm afraid not. Those laws are irreversible. And if you don't obey those laws, then uh, they take over. And they will take over humanity, which is much more of a problem for the Earth than it is for us. I think the planet will be perfectly happy, assuming that the planet has a soul and a thought process, would be much happier without us. Let's look at what they're doing. And let's look at what those billionaires are thinking about when they think the contemporary. They're thinking about how to make more money and how to have not just 7.7 trillion altogether, but 8, 9, 10, or uh, whatever. How, how can they um, make more money? That's their contemporary. So, um, these laws of physics, chemistry, and, bio and biology uh, are irreversible. That's part of our future. And as for the social and the political, I'm sorry if I'm disappointing any Marxists here, but um, I think that the nature of class struggle is also changing. It, it is still, of course, it's about um, wealth against poverty, uh, capitalists against labor, etc. But this too is changing. Now the contemporary, I think, is the fast again, uh, against the slow. The mobile against the stationary, the rooted against the migratory, and by migratory in this context, I mean those who can afford to move. All of you will you all speak English. You can all maybe in the future, if you if you want to take a job in New York, you will, you can move. Um, if you want to go to London or to another country. You all have the languages to do that. But millions and billions of people don't have that freedom to change their contemporary. And if they are slow and rooted, and if they are not mobile, then they are going to lose a lot of the prerogatives <coughs> that we all have, and for which we should be grateful but remember also that we are in, we're in the minority. Um, I don't know about an increase in conflict or not, but it seems to me that we're heading towards more conflict rather than less. There's a Canadian author who thinks this is not the, the case and that we are a much less violent world than we used to be, but I'm not sure that's true. But since this conference is also about the future, um, I want to situate the contemporary in a temporal way, and, and just say I'm limiting it to the, to the 21st century, because beyond that I don't think we can think about any, much of anything. Uh, our contemporary, if it's this century, is only 18 years old, but already quite a lot has happened that we weren't looking for. There's been the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, ever increasing power of banks and uh, of the financial institutions that organize massive tax evasion. Um, when there was a crash in 2008, which was the worst crash since the Great Depression, all of the bankers said nobody foresaw this. That is a lie. In my own organization in, in France called ATTAC, which doesn't do this, it's the acronym for uh, a tax on financial transactions aid citizens everywhere. It's not about attacking that way. Uh, but we foresaw it. We knew it was going to happen a year before it happened. Our economists were telling us at every summer university that this is, that this is going to happen. We were prepared for it. But the bankers were not, nobody was put in prison. And you know what they 
they got to, to restore the banks $14 trillion. I haven't multiplied that one. Multiplied by 32, uh, and, and you'll have the thousand, thousands of years you've had to look at your watch to reach $14 trillion. That's what the banks got in the Western world to get back on their feet. And now we have a situation where the 50 largest and most connected co companies in the world are financial, except for two, Walmart and the Chinese Petroleum. Otherwise, they are all connected to finance. They are hedge funds, or insurance, or, um, or, or banking. And they own bits of each other, which means that if they are that connected, this is what Scholars at the Zurich Polytechnic have documented, and they say, this is what they call the razor edge property. If something happens to one of those companies, its dominoes lined up and they're going to go and collapse. And since these scholars who published this in 2011 were using a database which included Lehman Brothers. And Lehman Brothers was on the list of the 50 most powerful companies and the most interconnected companies. And when Lehman Brothers went bust, seven years afterwards, they were still trying to figure out who owed money to whom. But that was the proximate cause, the proximate, not the long term, but the proximate cause of the collapse of 2008. That's something that, among the powerful, no one saw it was coming. But of course it was. And we've also now foreseen the huge and still growing inequalities among people. I tried to mention one between the billionaires and the people who are watching their children die today. But um, our Oxfam is telling us every year what those differences are. They become unimaginable, eight people on the ground in America, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we are not also seeing the rise of terrorism. It was very convenient for the United States to, and for Bush to declare war on terrorism because that two war you can never win, so you have to keep going. You have to keep that war uh, continuing. Uh, but this too was not um, was not foreseen, and the terrorism that answers uh, the the U.S. interventions, mostly from the United States, with the invasion of Afghanistan, etc. Um, these were not foreseen, and these are truly international and contemporary events. For the first time. There was a demonstration worldwide in 2003 against the invasion of Iraq. And there was even a team in Antarctica that was studying Antarctica, which brought out its scientists and they had to march around their base to protest against the invasion of Iraq on every single continent. This was the first time in the world that there was um, a mass movement on every continent. We all agreed for once. And I sometimes dream of having other mass events like that. I wish that were possible. I think that would be the best thing we could do now for the end. But there were also other contemporary events. I think we have to be aware of of, of what the Americans call silos. You know, you have, the, you have the movement of women here, and then you have the movement of Latinos here, and then the movement of, of African Americans. And sometimes these are beginning to come together, but they're only beginning. And I think in most protest, protest movements and in most social movements, we all have our goals which may be separate. But there have to be times when, since we are fighting for justice in different ways and on different subjects, there are times when we have to come together. And that happens very rarely. 
So let's be careful about silos or separation, uh, which are also which are also part of our contemporary. And then, as I started saying, I think the principles of the Enlightenment are gradually being abandoned, and this troubles me. The rule of law and the rule of men. I want the rule of law. I don't want the rule of Donald Trump, and I don't think many of you do either. By the way, I'm leaving out of this picture of the contemporary anything technological, A, because it doesn't interest me that much, but B, because I really know nothing about it. No view on what's going to happen with bitcoins or uh, at any of those things, but I think that a lot of people thinking of contemporary today are thinking it entirely in, in such terms. So anyway, this is this is possibly what Gramsci meant when he said that the old um, is dying and the new is struggling to be born, and in between is the time of monsters. And perhaps that's always been true. Perhaps it was true in the late 1920s and the beginning of the 30s when Gramsci wrote the prison notebooks. And I think he died in 2008 or 2009. You know, so, uh, but um, I didn't look that up, so I'm, <laughs> I'm just blabbering uh, on. But uh, we have a new situation in which monsters are prevalent. You need a monster practically on every corner now. Um, and this is um, very hard to grasp for people. Um, we've had time, but we haven't thought far enough. We haven't thought enough about the irreversible. We haven't thought enough about the weight of human history, the weight of other people's cultures and religions, and how much that can influence their reactions, which are very different from Western reactions. And I think it's our job as intellectuals, and you are privileged, as I try to explain, to think, try to understand, then react, and then act. We have a duty to go from thought to action. And this thinking the contemporary ought to lead to improvements in social and economic and environmental spheres of the whole of the if action has any purpose at all, it has to be right action. It has to be action in favor of justice and against the forces which are trying to finish off Mother Earth, if you want to call it Mother Earth, or you can call it just the planet. But um, this should be, I think, at the top of everybody's list. What the thinking about the future stops. That's the first time in human history. And I believe if we are consistent as intellectuals, what keeps us going? What keeps Bonaventura going after 40 years as director of the SESH? Uh, what keeps people writing in, in, into their 80s? 90s. What keeps an intellectual going? I think probably it is what hard scientists call self-organized criticality. Now that's a fancy way of saying that sometimes a system which appears to be permanent can change very good. The, the most famous example is the sand pile. You have the sand pile, which is in a certain configuration, and every second or, or tenth of a second, there's another grain of sand that falls, and another, and another, and another, 
and without changing the grain of sand, its nature, its weight, anything, and at an unpredictable time, and an unpredictable grain of sand, a grain falls, and the whole sand pile collapses and configures itself in a completely new way. And scientists are finding that this happens in any number of natural systems. You can't say when, you can't say how, and you don't know which element is going to make that change, but it does. And I think as intellectuals, we uh, are trying to reconfigure our systems. And we hope and we think that maybe it's a possibility. You never know. And nobody's going to be able to tell you or foresee it. Not your teachers, not your, uh, not your parents, nobody. But if you could be that brain, if you could be the person who said something, wrote something, thought something, put it down, made a movie, I don't know, could be any action that you could do as an intellectual, at some unpredictable time, you could change an important system. And I think that that is the ethical way. And we have to have that faith in what we cannot see and in the contemporary that we know is full of faults, full of terrors, but that perhaps we can change it. And that is our community. <coughs>